very glad we've had a strong mathematical session because I have a feeling mathematicians have something to offer in the problem I'm going to talk about. Um, now this starts with uh, one of the great discoveries in biology that we're all composed of cells. And possibly the next important discovery in biology was that those cells cannot arise uh, de novo, that, uh, that new cells only arise from the growth and division of pre-existing cells. And so these are really, this is one of the most powerful ideas in biology, and it's the basis of all inheritance. Now, um, at the heart of the cell division uh, uh, process is, is the um, replication, because all the instructions for the behavior of those cells and for their growth is encoded in the information in DNA, one of the most important events in the life cycle of a cell is the replication of the DNA to produce two sister DNAs. Now, in order for those sister DNAs to be segregated at division, they must be then pack be packaged into chromosomes. In fact, half chromosomes, they're called chromatids. And this chromatid will contain one DNA molecule, and this chromatid will contain its sister DNA. Now, in order for then those sister DNAs to be pulled to opposite sides of the cell, they must be joined together so the cell can tell that they are sister DNAs. And uh, these DNAs, uh, which are packaged into uh, chromatin fibers, little balls of, of, D of, of DNA called nucleosomes, we believe are held together by uh, this uh, complex called cohesin, which forms this giant ring structure, which we believe acts as a topological device. And uh, what uh, my, the, the, this, the award that I received yesterday was for identifying the mechanism by which the cell breaks the bond and breaks open that ring and allows those sister DNAs to go to opposite poles of the cell. Um, now, um, but there is another deeper problem uh, which we still don't understand the solution to. And that is that each one of the DNAs that constitutes just one of our chromosomes is an immensely long molecule. The average, uh, the, the, the average length of a DNA molecule, just one of our chromosomes in a human being, is five centimeters of DNA. If you're something like a salamander that has much bigger chromosomes, it could be a, a meter of, uh, half a meter of DNA. Um, and, and this is an example of all that DNA. This is at high resolution and looking at the DNA spilling out of one of those chromosomes. You can see it's a massive tank, a skein of DNA. If DNA was a wire that was two millimeters thick, then that five centimeters of DNA would in fact be 50, 50 kilometers long. How is that packaged into a cylindrical structure that can be segregated at cell division? Now, um, here is then is the, the problem that we face, is how after replication, you've got those sister DNAs all tangled together. And how is it that they then are, are, are packaged into separate structures, which will nevertheless be held together by cohesin so that they can be segregated opposite poles of the cell? This is what we'll call the, the DNA weaving uh, problem. Now, the textbook model, which has been there for 30 or 40 years, um, was that um, we know that the DNA is, is packaged into uh, nucleosomes by associating with histone proteins, which three, essentially two wraps of the DNA around these proteins creates these little balls. Um, and the idea was that you package the DNA into the nucleosomes, and then the nucleosomes form a sort of helical packing, and then you get super helical packing, and all of a sudden you end up with a chromosome. Uh, many of you will notice that this uh, uh, mechanism does not satisfy the optimal packing problem. <laughs> Uh, um, now, uh, but that's not the reason why it's, it's wrong, because actually you can't see these structures inside cells. And what's more, it doesn't explain how you get from here to here. It simply doesn't explain the problem. And now it turns out, um, largely for the work of uh, a very, uh, very uh, talented uh, Japanese scientist, Tetsuya Hirano, that we now know that the DNAs are packaged into chromosomes, uh, uh, not really by, they are packaged into nucleosomes, um, but they can't build a chromosome for you. 
uh, and, the, uh, and, and what Hirano managed to do was identify a completely different protein machine which somehow can take all this tangled mass of DNA and turn it into a chromatid. Um, and you can see that this machine that uh, Hirano discovered, it's called Condensin. You can see it's a completely different looking sort of machine uh, to the nucleosome. And you can see it actually looks very similar to the cohesin complex that I just talked about. Now, how does Condensin uh, achieve this remarkable thing of this tangled mass of DNA and, and assemble it into this cylindrical uh, chromosome-like structure? And many years ago, I got back from a climbing trip and was, had, a, had a whole lot of problem with ropes that got tangled up and started thinking about cohesin and condensin as topological devices and came up with the idea that if you could explain everything that needed to be explained, if you just said that condensin had a magical property, namely it could take a bite in the rope, a little loop, and then grow that loop out of the device. So it would have this ability to, as it were, extrude loops of DNA through this, through this condensing complex. The idea that different condensins would start at different places along the chromosome, they wouldn't have to know where to start. They just did it independently, and they kept on extruding until they ran into each other. And you can see, lo and behold, uh, just by this simple activity, you would take this tangled mass of DNA and assemble it into a, a cylindrical structure. because. Um, because in three-dimensional space, um, the different loops will repel each other, and you could explain why the chromosome ends up cylindrical, and you could also explain why it is there is a remarkable property that when condensing does it, it accumulates along the longitudinal axis of, of the chromosomes. Um, now, um, the other remarkable thing about loop extrusion is that it, 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 it solved the all, it largely solved the sister untangling problem because after replication you've got these sister DNAs all wound around each other in this tangled skein of DNA and what will happen is the, the condensins will start working on the two sister DNAs and, they'll, and what will happen is all the DNA that's gone, been extruded through those loops will be separated away from the sister DNA and all the tangles and the interweavings will get concentrated in the spaces in between these extruding devices. And that's where a set of enzymes called topisomerases, uh, which unfortunately we don't have as climbers or whatever it is, but they can actually pass DNA through each other and solve this, this, this inter, in, 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 intertwining problem. Um, well, this simple idea of loop extrusion was, uh, you know, I had it as a, as a climber, um, and, and uh, ropes are not a good model, actually, for things working in space and moving around. But much more recently, John Marco's lab and Leonard Mini's lab have done computer simulations of this, and it clearly is a feasible uh, uh, hypothesis. I think it's a very interesting question, and here's a challenge for mathemat mathematicians. Will it be possible uh, by mathematics to prove that well, that there are or are not other solutions to this fundamental problem. And it's, this has only just occurred to me this afternoon that mathematicians might be interested and could bring something to the party. Um, now, the, uh, I've just told you that condensin, whoops, um, condensin looks very like cohesin. In fact, they're first cousins uh, in, in evolutionary terms. Um, and, and condensin organi organizes the... Um, organized the, is, is DNA into chromatids, cohesin holds the sister DNAs together, but uh, more recently it has become clear that cohesin also can take, um, uh, take DNA and, and turn it into, into uh, chromosome-like structures. In fact, you've only got to take out one of the uh, regulatory subunits of cohesin and slow down the rate at which it leaves the chromosome and it will take the mass of DNA in cells in the middle of the cell cycle, which normally will not be condensed into chromosomes, and now you will actually, uh, cohesin will weave the DNA into chromatids uh, outside of mitosis. So cohesin and condensin share this ability to, to, to weave DNA into chromatids. Um, so if condensin is doing that by loop extrusion, presumably cohesin is doing it by loop extrusion. Now, what could, what would be the function? We've, I, can, I've, I hope I've explained to you why condensin would want to do loop extrusion. 
But why would Cohesin want to do it? And here is, 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 is what we think is going on now. Um, and that is, there's a very, another big problem in biology is how do you turn on the right genes at the right time during the development of organisms? And it turns out that the genes are turned on by so-called enhancer sequences, which are often situated uh, many thousands or many tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of base pairs away from the gene in question. Now, this poses a fundamental problem. Namely, how does this enhancer, it's meant to turn on this gene, but how does it avoid turning on this gene or this gene? And imagine you are, this is an oncogene that should be kept silent in a non-dividing cell, and this enhancer is, is meant to turn on this gene here. How, how does the cell ensure that the enhancer doesn't turn on this one or that one? And this is a, 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 a fundamental problem of, of how cells go about turning on the right genes at the right time during development. Now, a, a solution to this problem has recently arisen from beautiful work from Leonard Mirny's lab and Erez Liebman and Aden's lab. And what it really, the way we're now thinking about it is that enhancers are brought together with the promoters, with the legitimate promoters, by being extruded by this loop extrusion process. In this case, by cohesin. So through loop extrusion, you extrude the loop until the enhancer and the promoter come together, and now the enhancer can act on the promoter and turn it on. And the, the idea is that there are particular factors. It, this particular one is called CTCF. It's a site-specific DNA binding protein. And it sits on the DNA, and its function is to stop that loop extrusion process going beyond that point. Uh, and so the idea was, if you've got a CTCF binding site here and a CTCF binding site there, then this enhancer could only bring this promoter together through loop extrusion, but it couldn't bring that enhancer together with this one or with this one. Okay? And so that's the idea of why cohesin might be doing loop extrusion uh, in all of our cells, is, is that it's the mechanism by which uh, simple factors that bind to the DNA and regulate that process could, could help bring enhancers to the right promoter and preventing them going to the wrong one. So I now just want to, um, to, to the last part of this talk is to say what I think are the real key questions in this whole area. Though it can explain many mis hitherto mysterious properties of the chromosomes, loop extrusion remains merely a hypothesis. Um, and really to test it uh, and to know whether it's really true, we need to understand how cohesin and contensin perform this feat. Um, there are several key questions. Uh, how does uh, these insulator proteins, which are postulated to block the loop extrusion process, how do they actually do that? Um, so how, how does a factor here slow down this loop extrusion process? A second key question is, is when these, these, these complexes do loop extrusion, do they do it symmetrically by pushing both DNAs out simultaneously at the same time? Um, or do they do it asymmetrically? And if they do it symmetrically, then presumably the active complex would have to be a dimer of, 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 of cohesins or a dimer of condensins. And so one of the big questions in the field is how do these two ring-like structures, if there are two of them to work together to give you symmetrical loop extrusion, um, then how on earth do they, we don't know how they interact um, uh, to do this. Um, even more important uh, is, is what is the motor that, as it were, drives the DNA through the loop extrusion device? Is the motor uh, intrinsic or is it extrinsic? An extrinsic motor could be something like RNA polymerase, which pushes the ring along the chromosome. Uh, but it, I think it's much more likely that the uh, motor is intrinsic, and these uh, proteins have uh, ATPases down here, and they go through some work cycle, burning energy, burning ATP as they do so. Um, how do they actually translocate or move along the chromosome? Uh, do they have some sort of um, arm-like motion like this where they can, inch, they can walk along the chromosome? Um, and if so, uh, what are the bits of the complex that bind to the DNA and, and move during the process? 
and do the arms of this huge ring structure move uh, the DNA binding domains to allow it walk along the chromosome and therefore move DNA relative to the complex. Um, another thing which we cannot explain at the moment, if condensin and cohesin are doing loop extrusion, why do they form rings? Does that mean that the DNAs are, during this process, topologically trapped inside those rings? We don't know the answer to that question. And if they are, how do the rings open up to get the DNAs inside? Um, and lastly, um, whereas both cohesin and condensin are somehow walking along chromosomes, along DNA according to the loop extrusion hypothesis, and yet we know that cohesin, when cells replicate their DNA, DNA we believe that sometimes the sister DNAs will be trapped inside the same ring, and that's how you hold sister DNAs together. So how does cohesin switch from this sort of activity to this sort of activity upon the replication of chromosomes? And lastly, um, why are the answering these questions uh, not going to happen in, an, in the immediate future? Uh, uh, the, the, why is this a, a, a huge challenge? And the answer is that we cannot, what we'd love to do is just go in and look at these things working in, in more or less real time at a level of resolution that would be revealing. And the unfortunate thing is that we cannot actually do that at the moment. We can look in high resolution, but when we do that, we kill the cell um, or we, ha we have to freeze it. We can look at it, things in real time, but only at low resolution. And so this is the, essentially we're like being blindfolded and having to search our way towards understanding this problem. But undoubtedly new techniques for observing molecules in real time inside cells will contribute. Um, and lastly, thank you very much. Um, and I hope maybe mathematicians can solve the problem for us and say that is the only solution to building chromosomes. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. Do I see a question? I have one, but... Uh... There's one over there. Hi, Kim. Uh, hi there. Um, so you, you raised the issue of, of needing coordinate behavior uh, in the loop extrusion model, um, but uh, what about the issue of directionality? Uh, why going one way as opposed to the other? I understand about the CTF site. CTCF sites being a boundary, but, but uh, potentially, how do they know uh, which way they should be? Well, I think one of the reasons for believing it must be a symmetrical structure and that it must be, when it's being extruded, both sides of the DNA are being moved is that what, one of the things we know from the beautiful work of, of, from, of, from all this uh, high C is that what happens is that the frequently the extrusion goes all the way and CTCF sites at the boundaries are brought together. Now, so if you start thinking about how does CTCF stop extrusion, and if, if you believe the motor is intrinsic, presumably what happens when, when it gets to one of them, the motor is turned off. And if it stopped when it got to one boundary, you'd never bring the other one all the way there. It would stop in the middle. And yet, and yet we know it will go all the way to both sides. And that's why I think it has to be symmetrical. Um, we don't know the answers to any of these questions. I mean, ultimately, um, what we have to do is to get these, ends, these proteins to do this in a test tube to, to really address these questions. So Kim, I don't understand how your model can explain how you would co-regulate 2,000 genes, say. It doesn't. <laughs> and it's not a, it's really um, the role of insulation, this business of preventing enhancers, activating the wrong promoters. It's, for most genes, I don't think it's so terribly important because generally enhancers will activate the nearest gene. But we do know um, that this insulation is very important for very specific genes when they're turned on during particular stages in development. And what we really don't understand is why do some genes need insulation much more than others. But we do know that very, very small mistakes in this system. So if you just change one of the regulatory proteins, 
that we believe is the driver of the engine of the cohesion loop extrusion, uh, as it were, is the accelerator on the ATPase. Just a 30% drop in, in the activity of that ATPase well, leads to de absolutely devastating developmental defects associated with uh, a genetic syndrome called Cornelia de Lange syndrome. And I think the best explanation for this is that there are certain genes where this thing has to go at a certain speed for the, for the insulation to work or for enhancers to be brought together in the right way in the right time. But it's, it's, not, all, it's not all genes, it's, but it, it, it's a subset. And we, we do really don't know which ones more than others. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Could you speak about uh, the phase of DNA? So like a, a hot topic is that there's potential phase separation, that you might have liquid crystals, uh, like a kind of state, and how that would interact with your model. Like is diffusion, uh, the rates of diffusion among those like processes, how does that relate to you? I'm prob you're probably asking the wrong question, but I think that that sort of um, a little bit uh, relating to, to the packing problem is, is that, um, that, that if, if you create these loops, I think the feeling is in the field that the chromatin fiber within that loop um, will be very disorganized, and therefore you will, it will be, um, th th there will be more random pa packing process rather than this very specific structure, which will probably lead to a more optimal packing. Now, liquid, you're thinking of, of, of parts of the cell where, 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 um, which are behaving like liquid droplets. Is that what you're referring to? Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, certain, like, uh, I think there were two uh, nature papers, like the, depending on um, heterochromatin acts more like a liquid crystal. Uh, yes. Like phase separation. And so I was wondering um, how potentially maybe the, the sparse, the like transient interactions like you were saying by loops could potentially lead to those types of, of phase separated bodies. Um, the answer is uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, you know, the loop extrusion way of thinking of it is thinking of that here's something that's actively preventing it being at equilibrium um, because the, these machines are actively doing work. But one of the fascinating um, discoveries is, is we now, we do know that it is cohesin that is determining the topo topology of, of all the DNA inside our cells. And, and one of the aspects of that topology is that Active genes tend to all cluster get together, and inactive genes tend to cluster together. Now, but that clustering is not perfect. But if you remove cohesin from the cell, then that clustering becomes much more extreme. So as it were, uh, the regions of the genome which are inactive, they tend to be chem more chemically similar and form maybe what you would like, might call liquid crystals. But basically, cohesin is working against that, uh, shall we say, chemical, physical process in an active process to take you away from that equilibrium. So one of the functions of this loop extrusion thing is to break up such things. Um, and, and it essentially would break up, would help to prevent an active gene by mistake being stuck in an inactive compartment. So cohesin will go through and break these things up. Um, so I think it's the two, these are two different sides of the coin, and cohesin is working against that phenomenon. Okay, thank you very much. I think we should... Uh...